Hello everyone. Hey, thanks for waiting. Um, I wanted to uh, make an announcement. Um, unfortunately, Ed Greenwood won't be able to join us this evening. He was in his lab and there was this conjuration that uh, entailed uh, a mix of potions, uh, a curse book, uh, I think some stuff he gathered in the swamp, and uh, probably, yeah, probably some stuff he found on, uh, probably some stuff he found on Twitter. And, uh, and so, uh, and then what happened was it sent him, it propelled him through a, a portal and he's now spiraling aimlessly out into the astral, but, but his gnomish apprentices were able to make a magical automaton that looks almost exactly like the original Ed Greenwood. And so we're going to have him in here tonight. Um, and he said it was all right for us to play a original song. Uh, I wrote a song three years back and, and recorded it. Um, uh, based on my novel, uh, Age of Armageddon. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and play that as our intro this evening for a fantasy theme. And we'll be right back with Ed Greenwood. This is the folk song, Warrior Kings. Um, it's written from the writings of the Age of Armageddon novel and the upcoming comic series, Hayward Saints 8 Federal Offensive Responders. This is going to be a model for the melody and uh, in the lyrics. And so um, we're just going to do a run through and keep it loose. Um, and so here it is. came in scores through the blood-soaked lagoon, trampled valorous corpses all cleaved and all hewn. They growled viciously, and before we ran them through, we smiled playfully as we howled at their moon. Don't cry for me, dry your eyes, my darling, I'll slay them all, then I'll ride home to you. We warrior kings will survive, my darling, we'll drink to life, then I'll ride home to you. Conceived without love's permission she lives Mocking noble Cupid who weeps upon his full quiver An involuntary tithe in troubled time yields nigh The angels cry, the spirits shine, no shadow would survive Haunted by the dark lord, he knows her secret can a flicker of lightning, lightning turtle, darkness, and try to hide from his burning eyes to our dismay? A flicker was all he needed to find us. We warrior kings will survive, my darling. I'll slay them all, then I'll ride home to you. Don't cry for me, dry your eyes, my darling. I'll slay them all, then I'll ride home to you. Day of demons, earth will kneel in evil's flame. Forges angry steel. Clash teeth, gnash the wicked hearts, greed his needs. Dark pack the means, fulfill ambitious deals. Prey upon the sad and weak, a bloody path is shown. Demons speak, a soul to seek, and reaping what is sown. Spirit chain scrape remains what lies amidst the ashy stones. The moans of those whose bones alone were spared to build his throne. Don't cry for me, dry your eyes, my darling. We'll drink to life, then we'll ride home to you. 
We warrior kings will survive, my darling. I'll slay them all, and then I'll ride on to you. They come by quarter horse for my head in the morn. They'll row it abroad by the sea. But my skull was too cold for the demon kings of old. So they cast it and let me die free. They come by quarter horse for my head in the morn. They'll row it abroad by the sea. But my skull was too cold for the demon kings of old. So they cast it and let me die free. They cast it and let me die free. So they cast it and let me die free. Yeah. Don't cry for me. Dry your eyes, my darling. We'll slay them all, then we'll ride home to you. We warrior kings will survive, my darling. We'll drink to life, then we'll ride home to you. And they sang to us passionately And they cried for us their little innocent things Angels lied to us and we can never be free God lied to us that we can never live free. And they lied to us that we can never be free. And they lied to us we can never live free. Hey, all right, everybody. Thanks for waiting. Um, Ed said that uh, that I could do my my amateur bard thing, so uh, so I jumped at the opportunity. And so uh, you know, if you like the song, great. If you didn't, uh, just realize that I'm a jack of all trades and master of none, as you all know. And so I would like to, uh, without further ado, bring uh, the great Ed Greenwood. Hi. Hey, Ed, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Nice song. I liked it. You did. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, uh, it's uh, it was inspired at the very least, and I, I pride myself a lyricist more than anything. So the guitar was really just for pace, if you're wondering. <laughs> so, uh, and speaking of lyricists, uh, fantastic career, uh, Ed. You're one of my childhood heroes. I grew up uh, playing campaign settings in uh, Forgotten Realms, just like many of us did. I know that's probably the billionth time you've heard that, but I don't imagine it gets any less flattering. Um, <laughs> I, I would hope. And so, uh, and then the novels, uh, the Hall of Fame, uh, multiple Hall of Fames, multiple award winning, a, a fantastic career. Um, I wanted to talk with you uh, this evening a little bit about Forgotten Realms. Um, I've got some art here in the back from uh, Water Deep, uh, one of my favorite cities. Um, and I've got the symbol for the Harpers, which is one of my personal favorites. I've always played that class. It's so much fun. Um, but, uh, you know, when you started out, what was your what was your overall favorite aspect of like as far as the areas like the water deep area you got the sword coast you've got uh, the underdark like if you had to pick one now looking back on it what would you say your favorite as far as playing and writing it hmm well i i, I mean i started the realms before there was anything called D D, about 10 years before D D. so it was just a setting for my stories and it started with Mert the Moneylender. And Mert the Moneylender was swindling his way along the Sword Coast from the north 
to the south until he hit Waterdeep, and he, Waterdeep was big enough for him to hide in for a little bit. You see, all the early short stories, I was writing short stories, sort of like uh, Fritz Leiber's Fafer and Grey Mouser. Mm-hmm. And at the end of every story, um, Mert would face the new enemies he'd made, the local authorities in the city, and his old trade rivals, and they'd all be gunning for him. So he'd leave town just ahead of them. And That's then great the choice. next yeah, yeah. And then the next story, he'd be one port further south along what a year later after I started writing stories, about the third story, I figured out was called the Sword Coast. So that was where the realm started. And Waterdeep was the city that really first became uh, alive, fully alive around me. And then um, Cormier was another place I sort of loved. Hmm. And from northern Cormier, um, th- I followed the knights, um, the what became known as the Knights of Ithranor. They were the Swords of Evening Star then into Shadowdale. And Shadowdale became a favorite place. And there's also one other favorite place. Well, two, there's two or three. There's Silvery Moon and so on. But there was right. one other favorite place that's never really featured prominently. Uh, it was in FR5, but it's the Unicorn Run. It's oh, yeah. uh, um, in the high forest where that beautiful river comes down through the deep forest. And there's unicorns visible quite often on the mossy banks of the this river with the gnarled old trees with their... Um, canopies meeting overhead, and that's like a sort of special wilderness spot uh, in sounds my like mind. A sounds like a wonderful place to go camping as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Absolutely. we've never really featured it in a, in a you know it's it's mentioned, but it's mm. not really featured anywhere. So yeah, those are my favorite bits. But you know, um, really the the usual my usual reaction when when I get that question is. So, which of my children is my favorite? Thanks. You yeah. know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you they know. created all of them and stuff, but you always have that one favorite child. Is that what you say? <laughs> yeah, but but that you one. don't want to pick one in front of all the others. Yeah, absolutely. Know? We don't want it, the underdark to get jealous or anything. That's I mean, right. Yeah, absolutely. That's <laughs> <laughs> right, and that was always interesting to me as well. Like, I love Forgotten Realm setting and the. Like you said, you you mentioned the uh, the forest and those uh, magical uh, areas and the rangers that would uh, patrol them. And then the cities, of course, were bustling and full of mercenaries and full of thieves looking for coin. And, and like everything was so well done, obviously. But I enjoyed the Underdark. I love the monsters of it. And I love the, the I tend to go towards the darker stuff. I like Ravenloft as well, which when we spoke the other day. Uh, you mentioned that you contributed to, which somehow mm-hmm. I missed that as a kid because those just happened to be my two favorite campaign settings. Uh, and so like, but I tend to like those kind of darker stories. Um, I think it's because I started early in horror mm-hmm. and I, I automatically um, associated being scared with villains. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Villains were always so much more uh, exciting for me when they were scary. And so yeah. all those settings in those areas where there was, where you feel that danger and you see that you could see the horror in mm-hmm. it. Um, it just had that, that feeling of uh, of direness to it as far as adventuring when you're imagining it. And so I always tend to go towards those kind of things. Uh, and you created the dark, the drow elves as well when you created well, the Underdark, right? No, no. The race? The, 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 no, the, uh, the drow as we see them in D&D are Gary Gygax's creation. Okay. They are built off ancient Norse myths, the Dark Elfar. There are the oh. Dark Elfar and the Zvart Elfar. Um, and, but it was oh. Gary who turned them into um, gorgeous, uh, slender people with long pointy ears and obsidian skin. And then he sort of grabbed the, um, the idea of warring merchant, merchant houses from the Borgias and, and Shakespeare's idea of Italy with the, the warring houses and, mm. and developed that in the, in the uh, d- descent into the depths of the earth and then Queen of the Demon Web Pits, the modules, way oh. back when. They so yeah, that in the cartoons as well. And what was that like working with Gary? Uh, I I only worked with Gary um, very informally, usually at conventions. You see, I was never 
on staff at TSR or at Wizards for that matter. I've always been a freelancer. But um, when I got this long white beard, um, Gary had one too. And, and we'd, when we would be put on panels at, at, at a Worldcon or a, or a fan expo in Toronto um, of, you know, elder gaming gods. Um, and, and we would sit and chat. But but my uh, when when Gary was still at TSR, my um, reactions were hit with him were usually through the letters column in Dragon Magazine, or sometimes a photocopy of a memo that was handed to me by uh, Kim Mohan at Dragon Magazine or whatever. Because by then I was a creative editor on Dragon, contributing editor, excuse me. Creative came later. Um, those were unpaid positions. You know, it was an excuse oh, yeah. to use my stuff. I, I was on yeah, the masthead. Absolutely. I wasn't on staff. Um, so um, Gary was and gone. I know that from TSR. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, Gary was now. gone from the building be, by the time I got there. So I met him a couple times, but we never really worked together, unfortunately. <laughs> One of my regrets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. You worked with Tim Cask with the Dragon magazine. He was the creator, but he, was he the editor on the project? Uh, the Dragon Magazine. Or yeah, Tim. Tim was in? the editor, and uh, my first three years or so of of articles, um, all these nice little green postcards with Celtic knotwork around them would come to me. Your um, item, blank line, handwritten in, has been accepted for publication in issue, blank line, written in of Dragon Magazine. Expect. <laughs> A copy, a contributor's copy with a check inside it, sort of thing, and oh, and um, um, that was uh, Tim Cask, and then Tim left, and Jake, Gary Jacquay, or Jake, um, who is his assistant editor, became editor, and that's when they hired Kim Mohan to be his assistant editor, and Kim was a journalist rather than a gamer, um, and I attended an early, I think it was. It might have been Gen Con 17, or it might have been Gen Con 13. I can't remember which. At Wisconsin Parkside, in which Kim said, are you going to be at Gen Con this year? And I said, yeah, meaning I was going to take a Greyhound bus as a young kid and camp out at Jellystone Park and walk oh three miles to Wisconsin Parkside every morning. And That's Kim, awesome. said, Kim said, ah, let's take a walk. And we went. We pushed open the doors of Wisconsin Parkside, which was in a park of its own. It's a university campus in a park that the university owns. So you push open the glass double doors. We're going for a walk. And he said, how would you like to be an editor of Dragon Magazine? <gasps> oh, would yeah. I? You know. <laughs> right? Yeah, that must, have been, that must have felt great. And that's what started everything. And that was the opportunity. And that must have felt good because they saw your talent. You know, at that moment, those victories, when you're starting out, oh, yeah, absolutely. Those little victories are great. Uh, you know, even someone like, obviously, like, I'm still trying to punch through. But, you know, the people that did buy my book, if someone comes by and says, you know, they enjoyed it. I had oh, I had one lady come back to me and say that her husband, she bought it. She said, quote, my husband likes that kind of shit. And then she took <laughs> it home. And and she, I met, I saw her later at another show. I was doing here local. And she said he loved it so much he read it twice. And that was you know, obviously, I'm not making a lot of money off of that, but those compliments like that are, are those little victories when you're starting out that you hold on to and you keep pushing forward. Um, and I also wanted to add to you mentioned earlier that you guys grew your white beards. Um, I'm a little embarrassed because I think we agreed that we were going to shave for tonight and uh, and you obviously didn't. So but that's all right. I mean, <laughs> I shave some part of me. <laughs> all right. Well, that that counts. That absolutely counts. <laughs> no, I, uh, that's good stuff. I shave these every morning because oh. if I didn't, I'd be two eyes staring out of this hairy thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's amazing. <laughs> and, and, you know, there are people in Canada with guns and, you know, soon it'll be hunting season. And yeah, I don't absolutely. want to be mistaken for something. You, know? you don't want to be mistaken for Papa Bigfoot this time yeah. of year, especially with the COVID. Everybody's trigger happy. Uh, you know, you mm -hmm. have to be careful. You can't be yeah. too careful. Absolutely. And so, so here uh, I am, my slim felt revealed self. 
<laughs> um, so good. Uh, you um, you created Il Elminster as well. People have asked you many questions about him. They probably asked you how you created him, the, uh, you know, what the inspiration was for him and everything. Uh, I'm sure you've heard it all. Uh, but, uh, you know, writing all of those novels, obviously you were invested into the character. He started out as a character that you gamed with, obviously. You must have started uh, out. Nope. You played him first. You just created nope. him for the... Mm -hmm. Campaign said there, really. There was no role playing games when I created the realms. Um, hmm. D and D came along ten years later. D and D wow. and Tunnels and Trolls came along. Um, well, okay, I was writing realm stories in 1965. I didn't know they were realm stories. I was writing realm stories that I knew were set in the Forgotten Realms by 1966. D and D started in 1974. But only if you were in college in Wisconsin or New Gary. Hmm. The rest of the world didn't see D&D until 1975. And amazing. I, I didn't start playing regularly until 78 when the um, Player's Handbook came out and joined the Monster Manual. Because when the original three booklets came out, my gaming group bought them, like hmm. my group of friends and so on, because we played a large military war games and sand table games. And we read them and said, this is really cool. And we read through the booklets and said, oh, it's just going to devolve into an argument. Nice try. But I mean, <laughs> there's, there's not enough rules there. And then during the intervening years, they brought out Greyhawk, Blackmoor, Eldritch Wizardry. And we started saying, hey, this is getting really cool. I love these, you know, these magic bubbles and this beholder thing. Oh, this is really cool. Oh, you know. Yeah. Um, right. But, but when the player's handbook joined the monster man and we said this is jack vance's magic system beautifully laid out then i immediately converted the realms to match D, D because i said look somebody has done the skeleton for me now all the monsters mm -hmm. are balanced and i know exactly what they do um all the spell mm -hmm. i know exactly what they do so the magic user can't be a god in the machine the, you know, right. the wizard can't just rescue everything. He can't invent something out of his behind. These are what the spells can do, and they're fire and forget. You me you memorize them with great effort. When you cast them, they're gone from your brain. You can't use it again. So, oh, th this, this puts play balance, realism into the realms. And in the same way that if I was Don Pendleton, which I've never been, writing executioner books, which I've never done, um, the smart thing to do is to plan the gunfights so you don't fire a something that has 21 rounds in its magazine 48 times before you reload. You know, you should. Right. Yeah, you there should has sort to be of, a rhyme or reason. Everything yeah. is a rule set. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what yeah, that's what D and D balance. was. That's what D and D did for the realms. It gave me balance. So I just turned everything into, and then we started play in 1978. We started. I started reading Dragon in 1979. I started writing for Dragon in 1979, and the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, that was a nice piece of history there. And uh, when you mentioned the, um, you mentioned the Monster Manual, and I'm such a nerd. I used to sit up and read that at night. I read the source books, and the source material for Forgotten Realms. Uh, even when there's nobody to play, we had a regular gaming group weekly, right? And we'd just take turns hosting. So whoever's house you'd go to, their mom was the one making the food and the snacks for everybody. And then they were hosting and writing the games. Um, you know, I'm from a remote area. And so you're talking about how when you started, Wisconsin was Dungeons and Dragons. Well, where I'm from, it's kind of out in the sticks and you didn't really get a lot of options uh, at your hobby shop. Uh, and so uh, I was lucky to get the source material that we did, but it was a big inspiration for me to make my own stories. When we used up the, the materials that we had, you know, we never mailed away for books or nothing like that. I mean, we just took what was at the shop, used books, if we could, whatever we could get our hands on, our grubby little greedy hands on, we just swallowed Dungeons and Dragons as much as we could get. And so we'd all, we'd write our own adventures. And so it inspired me and honestly, that's the reason why I realized that I love the storytelling medium is because that inspiration sparked my imagination at a point where I was very young, 10, you know, and up. Um, and then I started writing for my friends and we'd take turns doing that. And so um, that early role playing was my love of fantasy and my love of uh, wordsmithing, so to speak. Um, so very early, uh, very early. I was 10. I may have even started when I was nine. We used to play. It was funny. We uh, I was in Boy Scouts. And we used to play, we'd go on camping trips and drive my dad crazy. But my dad was very cool. He was very cool, but we'd go on these camping trips and we'd always sneak our Dungeons and Dragons books and our dice bags and our 
camping packs and then everybody would be making s'mores or doing something around the fire and we'd be sitting by a lantern light and we'd be playing Dungeons and dragons out at night you know <laughs> under the stars whatever we could sit on and play tents we'd set up and drive my dad nuts he's like man we're out here we got the stars and all this stuff you guys get your nose in a book you know but um <laughs> you know <laughs> Yeah, I'm older. There was no D&D &D when I used to go camping. We used to tell ghost stories and scare the pants off each other. Yeah, right? Yeah, and essentially we were telling stories, but they were Dungeons and Dragons stories and uh but but I think it was uh it was nice that my dad encouraged it. My dad was a little bit of a nerd as well, so uh he was a Trekkie before Trek being a Trekkie was cool. Nice. Mm. Yeah, and so he's a big fan of original Star Trek series and he was an avid Marvel collector. He uh, collected the first 300 Marvel comics ever and uh, was I, I used to hear those stories as bedtime stories as a kid because um, mm. he didn't have the comic series anymore. But I'd hear like Thor versus Hulk and uh, uh, the Submariner versus Hulk or some of his favorites. He loved Daredevil. He loved the Fantastic Four mm -hmm. and Spider-Man. And it was funny because my dad had very good taste in comics because all of the, it seemed like all of those story arcs were all adapted into film recently you know what i mean the marvel universe all the great storylines were adapted either in an animated or a uh, or a um or a live action now uh we got on that subject we were talking backstage before everybody showed up and um i wanted to uh, ask you about your create everybody knows you wrote novels everybody knows you created uh forgotten realms you worked for dragon magazine but uh, one thing that i didn't know is that you wrote comics as well idw mm -hmm. you said and marvel and dc would you want to talk mm -hmm. about that a little bit, some of that process for the fans that came to see you? Sure. Okay, well, IDW is the most recent one, and that was a Forgotten Realms uh, series, short-lived. Um, and before that, uh, Devil's Due um, adapted Elminster at the Mage Fair, which is one of my short stories um, from Realms of Valor, I think. Um, uh, the which you know a fiction short story and um jim louder uh i was helming the 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 version of that and before that um i appeared in uh the tsr comic the grand tour and i hmm. appeared in the dc uh, comic adventures dungeons and dragons um because of the dreaded deadline doom issue that they they used up at the end when they canceled it had a visit to the tsr offices and every panel has people in it that you will recognize if you knew tsr and although i was not a tsr employee they snuck me in there as this fat bearded guy driving a forklift and the forklift has stacks and stacks of my realms papers of lore that i'm delivering <laughs> <laughs> somebody some poor schlub's desk <laughs> so they did um, kind of like a cartoon caricature just for the last issue just a thing for the fans that's very cool yeah yeah i dig it and yeah and i and um years and years before that i i actually uh and, and that was published by dc and years and years before that i was an unofficial continuity editor for marvel because marvel at one point moved offices and they didn't keep any copies of any of their issues oh i see so, so they were kind of well there well um and i'd get these weird phone calls because um they knew george olszewski who did the um overstreet buyer's guide for a bit um because there was this famous comic store up in toronto called the silver snail that was run by ron tom chuck and george and because of george ron got a phone call one day and said and they said, um, do, do you know anybody who has a complete run of the X-Men? <laughs> and he said, yeah, there's some guy up in Don Mills who, who's bought every issue. Okay. So via him, and then very soon via these weird phone calls, because this is before the internet, um, I would get this question. Okay, in the Beast's apartment, there's a sculpture on a table. When you open the door of the apartment, it is on. Is it on the left or on the right? And I would go, "Oh, that was back in issue." And I'd I'd run to my comic books and I'd flip, 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 and I'd say, "It's on the left." Thank you. <laughs> and so they had you like kind of scrambling for them because they had this "oh shit" moment. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So that's a pretty good story. Yeah, they've. Uh, you know, it's. 
that's what it is. These businesses have uh, probably have a lot of oh shit moments, and you know, comic industry has been up and down, and now it's uh, everything's shut down. And you know, production mm-hmm. from films as well now are shut down mm-hmm. with this with the pandemic. How have you been holding up during the pandemic? Well, um, you're look alive and well. Been, uh, well, yeah, I'm alive. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I've gone out. I think um, uh, okay. I have a day job in a public library, and that's been shut down for more than a month. We're on uh, week four right now. I'll just click my little report. I have to report in like a, like I'm a grade school student. Oh, I'm on week five now. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and we work from home, which is doing training webinars and stuff hmm. and also online work. But um, on top of that, I have design time. But it is broken up by um, the fact that everybody figures that I have, you know, nothing to do so it's time to do a podcast <laughs> <laughs> well so, I'm guilty <laughs> no it's okay that's fine it's fun because it it keeps me talking to people who mm. are myself or my wife or mm. nurses or you know it, it, it provides the human contact that we all need um and Absolutely. being as you know um covid has stopped um, the legions of skydiving sex people who used to fall into the fields all around me. Um, the only way to get entertainment is to talk to people on the inter- internet. So hello. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No, everybody's excited. We got some questions that popped in here, Ed, if you want to field Fire a couple away. of these questions. Yeah. All right, cool. I got one here. Uh, wait, let's see. Let's go back. Um, nope. Uh, a bunch of them. Dragon Heist. Still alive. These are comments. Everybody's interested. And in, uh, let's see what we've got here. We can talk about Maybe anything you guys want to talk about. This is cool. Oh, right here. Does it bother you, Ed, if Elminster shows up for small moments in our own D&D adventures? <laughs> not at all. I would expect him to. When he's not eating all my ice cream or robbing my liquor cabinet, he's going to be wandering around earth um sticking his nose into and it would be great great amusement for him at any time if you're not careful he could pop in and say oh here's another fine mess you've gotten yourselves into if you'd actually found the secret door three rooms back you might have survived but as it is oh well (laughs) as as it is you are absolutely and inequivocally quite dead (laughs) yes (laughs) <laughs> oh, so much fun yeah the the role playing side of it I think that was the best part of it with writing is playing out the characters you try to um, especially when you're younger too it's so free in your imagination um, it's been a while since I've been in a gaming group but I had a good gaming group the last uh, crowd that we were in they, I think they were doing a steampunk have you ever uh, what other things outside of the fantasy realm have you uh, taken an interest in written Oh, I've I've written science fiction. I've written romances. I've written mysteries. I've written a steampunk novel, The Iron Assassin, from Tor nice. Books, and and cool. it was great fun to write. Um, yes, it takes place in the Empire of the Lion, uh, the Lion being the King of England, but it's not the King you know and love. And and um, yes, there are there are airships and there are um, there are um, cool things, including uh, a Frankenstein-like monster who oh, dies nice. and is brought back from the dead. And, um, well, well I, I can't spoil it, but let's just say he has preternatural strength and can tear body parts off people if he wishes to. Absolutely. That's so awesome. And is it, was it inspired by Mary Shelley's? Um, the editor who gave me the contract for the book said, can we call this a modern Prometheus? And I said, if you'd like, but I don't think I want to do Dr. Frankenstein. And he says, no, 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 no. Just, just have a Revenant like character. And I said, sure, no problem. So yeah, it wasn't inspired by, but he was definitely thinking, can we cast it like that? So yeah, but I just make these things up as I go along. It's like life. Yeah. You see, this is where Americans get everything wrong. They have sports and they practice beforehand. It's ever so much more fun if you don't practice beforehand. You just go out on the playing field and do it. Oh, that's great it, advice. It, you do just have to go for it. No, that's absolutely right. I, I uh, When I started, uh, it was just one of those things where I was just winging it. I mean, I didn't have any experience. That book that I was talking about that I'm so proud of, 
I did that myself. That was just a passion project. I didn't even expect to publish it. I wrote that all in notebooks that I still have. And and then when I finished it, I, I enjoyed it. And I was like, well, why don't I publish it? I could self-publish it. And then I could say I wrote a book, you know? And yeah. it just started this whole cascade of things. And if I would have walked out of – there was a movie theater, actually. I watched a movie, and I remember – and it's a it's a forgettable movie, you know. I can't even remember the name of it, but I remember walking out of the theater and thinking, when the climax hit and the actor was supposed to say this big line that I was built up for, and the line was lackluster to me. It didn't have the impact that I was looking for, and I was like, man, I could have wrote something better than that. I would have said this or that. And I'm like, well, if I don't do it, then how am I any better than anybody else? You know, here I am talking about it. If I go back to my life and don't don't ever try then i'm no better i'm definitely not even close they they finished something so i yeah. need to i need to go and do this so i decided to just go for it and so ed is absolutely right you have to just you just have to wing it it's start that one moment will start you on a path and you just keep making choice and keep going forward uh you'll love it creation creativity and expression is just a, is beautiful in all of its forms in all arts and so uh, a, re a friend recently, too, as well, Ed, I told him the same thing. So after I was inspired by that, that in turn led me to meet a friend of mine. He was talking about the story he had in his head, bounced around, never published any work before. I said, hey, man, it's easier than ever to publish. We have print on demand. Go yep. for it. Start writing. You're a smart guy. All you have yeah. to do is talk on a page, t type it up. You're a smart, imaginative guy. Go for it. And he did just recently. I think like just last week he published through uh, Lightning Source self-published and made it available online and so do that's it that's getting yeah that's getting more stories don't don't um don't hold back go for it just jump in and don't try to practice you can always go back and edit it get some words on the page enjoy it have fun yeah. getting ideas down written down there's you know? this old saying the world's best saxophone player is walking this earth right now and nobody knows because he's never picked up the saxophone yeah do that's it right. Yeah, do it. You'll never know what you create. It could start you on that path, and you may be that have that great work someday that uh, that inspires someone. Very much like Ed. Ed has done so much work. We were talking about it uh, before. I mean, what'd you say? You you wrote seventy five novels, at least either wrote or contributed to uh, seventy five solo novels. Solo um, novels. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's another ten, twelve that are collaborative. You know, books Fantastic. I wrote with Troy Denning or Elaine Cunningham. You know two handers that have both our names on it, you know, and, and then there's about another 300 game books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, 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 it's an incredible body of work. It's almost like you don't have enough life to do it. Did you, did you find the fountain of youth somewhere along the way? I mean, no, that's something I, some people would need five lifetimes to write. It's fantastic. Well, okay. Here's the thing. I do write quickly. It's not an arms race. Hmm. I, I don't, I would rather read a great book that took someone like Professor Tolkien 20 years to write, and it's a great book. Because there are times when I've had to write stuff at blistering speed to hit a deadline, and you know it's not as good as it could be, because you just don't have time to slow down and write. Like, you, you end up writing fast action scenes because you don't have time to plot a good intrigue scene. You don't have time. You just got to go. Um, hmm. So I would rather people take the time and turn out stuff that they are happy with the result and enjoyed the process. So, hmm. you know, um, I happen to write quickly. That's how come I can get through that much stuff. But, you know, Although whenever t whenever an author dies, and I know there's not going to be any more books in the series, I am sad. Hmm. I can reread the really good ones that I love and enjoy and be so happy they got them done. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's the thing. We have so much time on, on this earth. And I think that goes into uh, what you were saying before. Go for it because life's short. You have a mm -hmm. life and go for it while you have the chance and do something, create, even if it's not writing, you know what I mean? If it's anything that's a creative, I mean, those creative expressions are, are valued maybe even more so now with this pandemic, now that we're home and by ourselves, those things that you can do to express yourself, even if you don't have a way to share them right away, they, uh, uh, they're rewarding in themselves that uh, I wouldn't want. Uh, once I started with my creative medium, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, I don't want to do anything else. You know yeah. what I mean? Obviously, to, I want to do the normal life stuff, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh, to to still, paraphrase Gandalf, what matters mm -hmm. is what you do with the time you are given. Yeah, that's right. While you got it, go for it. 
and especially now I've been telling a lot of people uh, uh, people that I've talked to I, I heard some people wanting to publish but they're like oh no it's kind of not a good time with the pandemic uh, with COVID it's not uh, this is a great time to, to publish and make things available online and do content online because like you said this is a time for us, human contact doing uh, doing shows and, and live podcasts but also uh, you know publishing work making it available people want content they might yeah, want a good book to read if you're gonna wait for the best time it will never come. There will never be a best time. That's right. There's always something with life. It's always struggle, And there's another it? trick. There's another trick that I learned from TSR. Because hmm. there were so many designers at TSR who just wanted to tweak something. Oh, it's not quite ready. I just want to tweak it. And Bruce Hurd's job at TSR, when he wasn't being acquisitions manager and dealing with freelancers, outsiders like me, was to march into somebody's cubicle upstairs in designer land and say, hello, production is waiting for such and such. I know you just want to tweak it, but I'm here to rip it from your cold, dead hands. <laughs> and if they aren't cold and dead yet, we could arrange that. But production needs it now. Stop tweaking it. You know, so, I mean, that was his job. You have to, and, and so I would say the right time to release something is the moment you're finished. Read through it, catch all the spelling mistakes, read through it again. Is there anything that you're really unhappy with? And if there isn't, if it's, yeah, if you think it's okay, put it out there and move on to the next thing. Kick it out of the nest. Because otherwise, 20 years from now, there will be this novel you never published. Because the time wasn't right, or you, you were just waiting to draw a cover or something. Get yeah. it out there. We want to read it. We're greedy readers. All of us are greedy readers. We, right. we can never know how brilliant you are, and we can never make you rich beyond the dreams of avarice if you don't put that novel out there for us to buy, or comic book, or graphic novel, or um, stage play, or epic poem in Sanskrit, uh, or in cuneiform. Put it out there. <laughs> Absolutely. You heard it. Ed Greenwood told you to get off your butt and go make something, go make something happen. So um, that's great advice. I agree. Uh, uh, you know, the worst thing I ever did was hesitate on anything. You always pull the trigger, go for it. Um, you can always go back, like you said, and tweak it, but uh, you know, don't sit on those ideas. You know, if you, if you feel like you can do something to contribute to entertain you love, why not do it? That's the point of it is to inspire. And, and that's happened since the beginning of time, since people were scribbling, uh, on cave walls, you know, they would do writings and inspire to later generations and it's passed on and that's how we we get these creative mediums. So uh, Every piece that contributes has an opportunity to inspire somebody else And so that's kind of what I love about it. I like the idea of sharing. I'm not in it for the money Like I never really cared about mo if I want money. It's because I want to uh, I want to facilitate doing it more The more money I have the more projects I can do the more project I can fund I keep exactly writing is yeah. why I want it. But I like simple things. I like food. You know, I don't really like expensive things. I don't like motor sports. I like to sit in my dungeon here and, and write stories, write funny books. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, yeah, as so long as we have money for food and more books. Yeah. It's all good. That's all, that's all I need is to eat and write. I mean, eat, sleep, mm -hmm. and write. Yep. So absolutely. Uh, and so uh, you mentioned that you uh, – you know, you've got the novels covered, the D&D content. You wrote for major comic publishers. What's Ed Greenwood doing now? You said that you're doing online seminars. Are you working on any projects that you're planning on publishing and releasing? Or, Oh, sure. Um, right now, I'm struggling. Um, I had heart surgery, so I'm slowed down. Um, there is a gentleman called Ken Spencer who created a game called Rocket Age. And Rocket Age used to be published by Cubicle 7. Um, its designer, Ken Spencer, now has the rights back and is publishing it himself with Why Not Games. And he did a Kickstarter, and I was one of the goals. So I have to finish um, Bold Brigands of the Belt, um, who are pirates who live in the asteroid belt in our solar system. Because Rocket Age is one of those lovely pulp science fiction things where you put glass globes on your head and go out in space with ray guns, okay? So oh, that's cool. <laughs> I am so writing that's that. Fiction. Yeah, that's science fiction. I have just finished a novel for Fate of the Norns, which is ancient Norse role-playing, 
um, done by a Canadian publisher, um, Pendlehaven, which is Andrew Volkoskis, who created this lovely game called Fate of the Norns, uh, where you play Vikings in ancient times. And the game mechanic, you cast runes. You actually weird or throw rune tiles down to decide on how, game outcomes. And I've written a novel called The One-Eyed King. When, in real life history, the Vikings conquered Dublin way back when, when it was called Athclias. And they ruled it for about seven years before they got pushed out again. Well, this novel is set at the time when a Viking king, and he's a one-eyed king because he sacrificed to Odin when he was a teenager. Odin has one eye. So this teenager ripped out his own right eye and threw it in the fire as a blot or sacrifice to Odin. So he's the one-eyed king. And it's a story of a bunch of people who come to Athcliath, and maybe some of them are there to kill the king. And it's oh, what happens. So oh, cool. uh, there's going to be a Kickstarter, and that's going to come out. And I'm probably going to do some game stuff with Andrew to support it. And I'm also going to write a modern horror novel um, as part of a, a group of people who are writing... Um, in, a, in their own shared universe, in our modern world, hauntings and ghosts. And I shouldn't say anything more about that until it's ready to, but yeah, uh, and I I've got, to. yeah, I got tons of projects on the go. And, oh, and that's fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm busy, busy, busy. So um, now where can we get links? Like I tried looking up why not games and I didn't, I was listening to you and I didn't want to be rude, uh, type in here, look, searching around for stuff, but is there like a, uh, is there a collective spot where they can get all of your projects where people can follow you? Because these, a lot of us are diehard fans. We'd like to see exactly what you're doing and be able to get ac easy access to all those projects. Do you have something like that, like on your web page? Or... I don't really have – um, the best way to get hold of me is on Twitter. I don't mm. really do a web page anymore. I did start a publishing company, mm. um, the Ed Greenwood Group, which went bust. So all of its web presence is gone. And it was a um, a mixed media company to try all sorts of things for various settings that could be shared by many writers. And who knows, some of those settings may be resurrected again, but I have to legally wind up the company and everything first. I do see that Rocket Age, if you do a Google search, Rocket Age does come up. Rocket Age RPG for 5e by Why Not Games um, does come up um, as a past Kickstarter. Um, okay. And and there are other th and and the five E version is is going, um, and and uh, I see I see there a question or a comment from Liz Emery. Yes, I do I do narrate audio stuff, and and I as a volunteer as a teenager I used to do um, books for the CNIB, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. I used to read books and I used to do the voices and I used to do sexy radio voices if you're sitting comfortably <laughs> so yeah I do oh, yeah. all those sort of things <laughs> nice I popped that question up I'm glad you caught that one yeah because uh, they said they enjoyed your narrating and the voice uh, it's exciting so that that's maybe that's something too I mean you could, if you got a, a little bit of room on your plate if it's not going to push anything off you start getting into re audio books and <laughs> Yeah, give it. <laughs> I'm sure he would buy one. He's not like he was ready. So, yeah, people are Once doing audiobooks. Once upon a time, far away and long ago, when there was a spider creeping up your arm. Yeah, I could have fun doing that. <laughs> hey, that's fantastic, man. And you should be doing some voice work. Hey, if we get going, I've got a bunch of things that we're doing. I mean, I know it seems like you're obviously very busy with uh, with the publishing and the writing and those contracts, but you've got a fantastic voice for narration, man. Maybe if we get going and we maybe hook on to some kind of gaming or some kind of animation, we'll have to give yeah. you a jingle. We'll have to give yeah. you a jingle. You yeah. never know. You might be a big Hollywood movie star for voice acting, you know? Yeah, we'll, well get you on the red carpet. Well, it be for voice acting. It's not going to be for looks, but yeah, <laughs> sure, okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, How old God. do you think I am? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's so good yeah yeah i can't i'm interested in that i'm interested in all types of media because i did the uh the tabletop thing but also i grew up like when atari first came and mm -hmm. the gaming interests me and i have a big animated film collection like from dc animated and a bunch of others that's great animation over the years one thing i really liked was fire and ice 
Remember mm -hmm. that? You remember yep. that uh, that animated? That was beautifully done. Wasn't the artwork fantastic for that? Yes. Yeah. I yeah. Enjoyed that. I I grew up unfortunately in the era of really bad Saturday morning cartoon animation, <laughs> where all the all the characters are absolutely motionless, and then you hear whoosh, and then a character turns his head. <laughs> and, and that's it, Just you know. Quickly and yeah, yeah. yeah. So oh, could, yeah. they could redraw three three frames, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they're pretty good now. They can use CGI like uh, computer generated. Yeah. And uh, oh, I've got a question here for you, Ed. Uh, Robert yeah. D says, uh, "Who is the official gatekeeper now of Forgotten Realms?" Well, uh, Wizards of the Coast is the copyright owner of the Forgotten Realms. The head of story at Wizards of the Coast is Chris Perkins, a transplanted Canadian and a great guy. Um, and he writes these mega adventures like Storm King's Thunder and Waterdeep Dragon Heist. And in that way, he um, shepherds the Forgotten Realms forward. Now, uh, the head of rules for D&D, &D, the, the answer guy for rules, is jeremy um but uh, jeremy crawford uh and i don't know what their official titles are but what it works out to is the guy who's helming the stories set in the forgotten realms is chris perkins now um the my original contract with tsr which is what wizards inherited that's the only reason that they have the rights to do um, Forgotten Realms is because they inherited it from TSR. Anything I write about the realms is canon. If I talk about the realms, if I say something, if I write something, it's canon until it's superseded by something official. Hmm. Like if Wizards contradicts something I says the next day, Wizards is right. The, the most recent published thing that is official is canon. But until then, anything that I say or write is canon. That's the way the, the agreement has always been. Oh, wow. So um, Chris Perkins is the gatekeeper. And I'm the guy who opens the gate and blathers something at you until he keeps it. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're going to say is you are the valiant paladin that kicks the gate in and comes in headlong into the fray, is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. And, and, I knew. and I understood. Cr and Chris is the guy who comes along and says, oh, oh, that's a horse of a different color, and closes the gate again. <laughs> <laughs> that's good stuff. Uh, I love, uh, oh, that reminds me of something else I wanted to talk about on the writing side of his uh, creative freedom. You talk about people who are gatekeeping, uh, you know, not necessarily that, but, you know, editors, people have creative control, then you're right. You know, the difference between writing for somebody else and writing something that you want to write specifically with no interference. Uh, you have written a lot of content, so I'm going to go ahead and make my prediction. I think that you like having the creative freedom, uh, but I'll go ahead and wait for your answer first. Yeah, I love having creative freedom. freedom. Yeah. Um, now, uh, when I'm writing a Realms novel, hmm. I always ask, and if you look at the last Realms novel I did, Death Masks, um, there was a shopping list of things there in the novel that I was asked to mention or highlight or or allude to. Uh, every, everything from Omen, Omen is, is a, Lord, a mass lord of Waterdeep, that sort of thing. Um, and that's my delight. If I'm writing in the realms, I want to do that because I want my novels to be one of the things that helps tie everything together. So I don't mind. But as a general rule, as a storyteller, yeah, I would love to have greater freedom to do my own thing, hmm. which is why I'm more inclined now um, to self-publish. I mean, I, yeah. I can publish with the big New York houses, but if you get an editor who you don't see eye to eye with, or even worse, an editor who changes things behind your back and then it just comes out in print, yeah. Or, as happened to me the last time at Tor, my last Tor book had six mm -hmm. editors because they kept Jeez. getting promoted. They kept getting promoted and changing jobs and handing all of their work 
to the next editor along or a new newly hired editor or whatever. So I'd get these emails saying, hi, you don't know me. My name is, but I'm now the, oh my goodness, again, you know. <laughs> I know, right? Like too many cooks spoiled the soup. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, 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 it turned out to be a, a delight at the, the editor I ended up with at the end and all of them along the way were good people and they did well by the book, but it could have been a disaster. I mean, just think about it. We are all in this racing car together. And now that we've got it on a major public highway and interstate, and we're racing along at over the speed limit, six mechanics want to work on the car as it's driving down the highway. Yeah. What absolutely. could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Everything times six. <laughs> yeah. It could have been a, a disaster. It wasn't, but it could have been. So, yeah, given my druthers, I would always rather have complete creative control and the other thing is i've been doing this long enough that i know when i need to stop and ask somebody else is this working mm -hmm. and i know when i'm i can run with my instincts and i want to tell whoever the editor is just stay out of the way until i'm finished mm -hmm. then if it didn't work you can jump in and jump up and down on me but don't micromanage me paragraph to paragraph saying oh you haven't told us who's come through the door well, if you'd read the next paragraph, it tells you it was a cliffhanger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got to go through that whole thing and you're constantly explaining yourself to somebody yeah. who is reading it from the outside. Yeah, absolutely. And you made a great point I wanted to mention uh, while we're talking to everybody about writing is uh, having a support group. That's something you were saying. You built up industry friends that are professional writers that you can that you feel confident bouncing your work off of. So having a support group of people who, even if they're not professional writers when you're starting out, you know, you're not going to know those kind of people who, who publish at those larger houses. But, you know, if you do, it's great. But if you don't, take your friends that you respect, people who you respect their opinion, uh, people who you hang out with and you like the same kind of things, the same genre. Those are great resources as well. And those can be just as handy if they're somebody who, who has a good, solid, respectable, uh, you know, an opinion that you respect on genres or whatever things you guys enjoy together. Uh, use that as a resource, bounce it off them, have them read it first, see what they think. Um, and so mm -hmm. I'm, I've been very fortunate to have that, even though I'm very new. Uh, the guys that I got in with Do's Comics have a lot of experience, and there's a lot of writers that uh, we work closely with, and we have a, a board of trust, and we're able to do that to read each other's work and work together. So um, that's a beautiful resource to uh, to get more ideas or to get an insight on your writing if you're at a spot, because that happens when you're writing. There's stuff that you're sure of and you feel, and then sometimes you'll write something, and then afterwards you'll read it, and you're just not sure, you mm -hmm. know? You're not absolutely sure if it fits or whatever, and you want a second opinion. So it's nice to be able to have those things, I think, because that happens to everybody. I mean, I, obviously, I don't. you have way more experience, so you know, uh, and I'm pretty new, but even I've experienced it. So it's going to happen, those kind of times. Mm -hmm. Those things are going to happen to you in the process. But write yeah. it for yourself first. Don't, yeah. don't get an idea and then say to your, then go to a beta reader and say, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. No, write the thing first. Because otherwise, they have nothing to go by. Oh, yeah, you want to write an epic 18-volume uh, series, uh, and it'll be made into major Hollywood movies. Yeah, why not? You know, yeah, <laughs> you got to do like it that. first. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, and it takes, uh, it takes a lot of work sometimes. It is for mm -hmm. developing and things, too. Like, um, we, I wrote a four-issue series that what that's not mine that I wrote for the studio. And I was trying to fit somebody else's vision. So when I do that, I have a sit down Q&A session. I write my outline um, and we tried to make it work. And at the same time, there's certain things, you know, I'm giving advice as a writer and this guy uh, who created it is an artist. And so he had a, a rough outline of what he wanted it to be. And I'm trying to convert that into a polished work. And so that's where we were back going back and forth. There were things that he didn't want to do with the character. And there were things mm -hmm. I felt I had to do to make the story work. And we were able to come to an agreement. And then once we got all that together, I got my outline to wrote. And then by the fourth issue, it's a mini series. Um, I had 12 pages of notes of things that happened in the previous three issues in this first half of the fourth issue that I had to bring together for the for the climax and for the ending. And so there's a lot of work when you're writing for for somebody else that way and being able to uh, being able to collaborate with them, talk with somebody else and, and stay true to their vision. Like that's, mm -hmm. it's different than writing for yourself, but, um, 
but it, you know, putting the work in, you have to do it. Um, it's different than novel writing, obviously, but I think uh, I took it seriously. And with uh, novel writing, you can do the same. You can take notes on your own work to help you finish it. Um, you want to you want to take a note of important things that are in your story and make sure that you bring those together at the end. So mm -hmm. now, uh, take every piece of writing advice that we give you with a handful of salt. Because yeah. it's different for all of us. Some people, they have to plan everything. Other people, planning everything kills the story and then they can't write it. They, it it's in their way because they planned everything. So now there's no, what do I do now? No, I, the life has gone out of it because it's all planned. Uh, Shannon Germain um, once said on Twitter, keep the story feral. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I I wish I could do that. I know exactly what you're saying, Ed. I'm uh I might even be just a little OCD about it. I mean, if I could show you my desk, I don't want to take my cam up because it's because it's mounted there, but my desk is just a mess. It looks like pickup sticks, only it's notes. <laughs> my mm -hmm. wife gets at me all the time about it because it's a, No, that it's means a it's a working desk. <laughs> it's working it, all right. It's if you up a go lot of space. into somebody's office and the desk is clear. I think there's somebody who does no work. Must be a boss. And the and the sec and the secretary comes trotting in. Could you sign this, please, sir? Ch -ch -ch. Can you sign this, please, sir? And their desk is clear. No, no, no. I want to see a desk that's piled high with crap because that tells me that's somebody who's at working. They're oh, busy. Yeah, it's, They're working. <laughs> oh God, there's so much stuff. And then also there was oh. the uh, the stuff for World of Game Design too. The last couple of years I was working for uh, Jared. And so um, I know you guys were working over at the old guard games side of things. And I was working, uh, I was writing for Mythhorn, and I was doing Cthulhu epics and I was doing uh Tankar's tavern. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote some adventures for him at Tankar's tavern. He liked it. I wrote the line, uh, bless my beer soaked beard, which isn't as good. <laughs> it's not as good unless you read it as a Scottish dwarf. So I don't yes, think I can and... do it that good. <laughs> Dwarves always Scottish. Sigh. <laughs> I know they always do that. I I can't help it. It's a stereotype. So I wrote that he was happy with it. And then uh, what uh, else we have? I bring news from a laird. We're gonna go through the through the new. Hand me a tankard. <laughs> Who start? Hey, you would know better than me. Who started that? Who said that all dwarves were Scottish? Uh it was around in the days of the early Apazines. There was a um amateur press association magazine so we're talking 1975 1976 there was a guy who played all his dwarves as um uh as scots and mm -hmm. he would he would crib stuff from the goon show uh the goon show had a um one show was called the terrible mccreaky uprising of 76 and it it had jokes in it like Ah, it's Chisel Mick Chisel, the steaming kilt, and and they'd say things like, "We're gonna march north on the tower," meaning the Tower of London, and the guy would say, "But but the tower is south of here, right? We're gonna march right round the world and sneak up on them from behind," <laughs> and it was full of little, and so he used to put all those into his role playing a dwarf at the table. So oh, it's, it's at least that old. <laughs> it's at least that old, but that's a great story. That's a good starting point. As good a starting point as any. I'm good with that. And so, uh, so yeah, yeah, I was working over there with Jared. So I uh, knew you guys. I thought that was great. The pay was good. And I loved writing mm -hmm. from where I wrote, um, what was it? A, a source book for Kickstarter for them, for the Talak mine. Mm -hmm. He was doing some 3D printing. And so I was fulfilling that. And there was a couple other stories. He had me do some adventure modules which he worked with me and uh, I learned how to do those there. I'd never done any adventure modules before I started working with Jared. So um, I thought that was great. I got to do some short stories. Uh, the short story I, I sent to you uh, mm -hmm. was actually one thing that it was unpublished, but it was a thing I sent to him uh, you know, early, early when I first started working for him. And then he started, I slowly got more work, but that was okay. You said you, you sent it to me oh, in yeah. chat, but what about yeah. the, the, the preview comic that I sent you too? Did you enjoy that? Sure, I enjoyed all of them. They all have the problem of, um, okay, if you or I are writing a James Bond mm -hmm. uh, story, everybody knows what a car is. Everybody knows what a gun is. Everybody knows what a telephone is. So right. if James Bond uses any of those things, you don't have to stop and explain what it is. That's right. 
in a fantasy or science fiction setting, there are so often things you have to explain. And if you're if you're bringing an entire setting in with intrigue, say, say you're doing a a, um, a medieval fantasy, and the king is elderly and somebody's trying to poison him. And there's all this intrigue at court. You have to bring all those characters on. You have to explain what the kingdom is. You have to explain who the villain is and what the stakes are. It's a huge info dump. Yeah. Info dumps at the beginning can be fatal. I, I can think of only a few of them that have worked. Um, 2010, the sequel to 2001, has a huge info dump at the beginning. And it works. And it's one of the very few that works because they managed to unfold the stakes of the story during the info dump. Mm. And even though the story hinges on science, it, you know, they're actually saying, have you checked the orbit? You know, <laughs> because the orbit of the, the, the spacecraft has been, you know, oh, that's the plot point upon which that forces you to do the action. Uh, mm. We're doing science here. You know, whereas usually you start, like a James Bond would typically start with people shooting at each other while cars are racing somewhere and you that's just right. plunge them into the action. And What's your favorite that's... James Bond film while you're talking? I don't want to do really Ooh, too much. I, Di- I don't have one. Yeah, um, I like Diamonds. Diamonds are forever probably with, uh, with Sean okay. Connor. It's very good. Yeah, okay. You see, for me, I have favorite scenes. Like the in for Russia with love, the the little scene with the uh, oh, yeah. the guy at the border. Um, Live and let die. The the scene where the, the wedding is going on and the boats go skipping through it. Um, oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah that was good. Uh, you only I, live twice. There were scenes too that at the beginning. I yeah, like how you and, take this and, death. Yeah, and Casino Royale, the the beginning scene that they they chopped from the the thingy where the cricket match is going on. The 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 remake, the the second Casino Royale. Not the David Niven one, um, the Daniel Craig one, and where they start with um, Bond in Prague, cutting back and forth to the cricket match, because that was just, and then have the intro with the with the theme and everything, because that was just like brilliant storytelling. I mean, you you watch that and go, that is absolutely brilliant storytelling, and that is a perfect example of what we've just been talking about. How do you get somebody into the story and interested, and then force feed them all this information without making them go, oh, this is too much like ba- being back at school in class. Yeah. Slam the book shut. I'll find something easier. Um, or right. when do we get to the sex scene? When do we get to the car chase? When do we get to the shootout? When do we get to, where's my payoff? Because Sesame Street has affected everybody in North America. They want a quick payoff. That's right. They don't have the attention span. Whereas... I can recall reading stuff in my father's library when I was a kid that I wasn't supposed to be reading, Hmm. you know, stuff with sex in it and stuff with people getting shot and so on. And it would be 10 pages of, I'm sorry, my Lord, but I, I fear we're going to have to kill you now. (laughs) Oh, why can't we have dinner first? Or may I, may I sample that excellent whiskey before you shoot me? Hmm. Perhaps it would be yeah. better if I taunted you for longer. And then it goes on for 10 pages and you're going, ah, it's it's yeah. like the old British farce where there's a banana peel sitting in the middle of the stage and the audience knows it's there. And you keep waiting for someone to step on the banana peel and they keep just to being about they're striding across the stage and just the phone rings and they turn or somebody opens a door and speaks to them and they turn and you're going yeah. banana peel. Banana peel, banana peel. And then 20 yeah. minutes later, when you've forgotten about the banana peel, the scene ends with somebody walking across the stage and suddenly slipping on the banana peel. And you go, oh, yeah, the banana peel. And they made it last that long. That, That is the art that we are all searching for. The, the art of pacing, the art of getting you into the story, gripping you with the story, and then going, oh, yeah. And the world hangs in the balance. I'd forgotten about the world hanging in the balance. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it would be entertaining to get that pacing. Um, you know, I worked with the guys. We've got a great staff. Uh, the guys that taught me scripting uh, were very good. I am very raw, though. I am very. I learned how to write script, but the writing just comes from all the pop culture I've absorbed. And I, I think I've been very lucky because my instincts, as far as things that are good, have always been either awarded or been – uh, critically acclaimed is good. So I just took that as a, as a fact that I had good instincts. So I just follow my instincts a lot of times. 
I, they had to teach me the structure because I was a mess. <laughs> I, said, I didn't know what to do with that. I was very raw. I'm very good. That's where the word nerd comes from, by the way. I'm an aficionado of words. It's conversation first, and then I translate that into writing, and then I had to learn script. and then uh, But uh, the written and, and uh, read word is oh, uh, just a second. Ed, technical Whoa. difficulty. I pulled my headphones out. Oh, no. Well, then, let me take over. All right. <laughs> Here's All a right. trick. For, here's a trick for people who don't know how to pace a scene, a particular scene they've reached. Um, find a rock video that tells a story on YouTube. A rock video that that actually has a story being told, as opposed to um, three minutes of the guitar player's pelvis gyrating or whatever. So we're talking, say, okay, how about Madonna's Like a Prayer? Okay, mm -hmm. turn the sound off. You do not want to hear the song. And just watch the story, which has less than three minutes to tell a story with a beginning, middle, and an end. And just pay attention to what you are showing on the screen and how long it's on the screen. How little information do they have to convey to you for you to grasp what's going on? who the bad guy is, who the good guy is, what the stakes are. How can they do it just with screenshots? You can do it with other things, but I would say a rock video is a nice short way. Hmm. And and the, the temptation when you're doing a feature film is to pick something you like, and then you are so blown away by the filmmaking that you get lost in how good it is. And of necessity, it's longer. So you're dissecting a single scene like say the crop dusting scene in North by Northwest, or it's too much of a meal. It's, it's a three hour movie you're trying to dissect. So stick with a rock video, turn the, the music off completely and just watch it and go, okay, we got three seconds of this person's face. They're frowning. And then we got two seconds. Oh, okay. Why did they do Did that work? Oh yeah, that works. The jump cut. You know, stuff like that. And and that's one way of deciding how to pace a scene. Because you could do a written scene the same way. You can actually say, and we cut to his face. He did not, he was no longer smiling. There was something cold rising in his eyes. Cut back to the guy with the gun. You know, you can actually do right. it like that. That's right. When you're writing novels, you're describing all of those aspects of it. And so it's good to be able to visualize those. And especially in comics as well, that was very important to be aware of how much page you have, what you want to be showing uh, while you're just, you know, you're describing the panel and also the dialogue needs to match to tell a seamless story. And so that's something mm -hmm. you want to be very aware of in any writing medium where you're writing, whether it's a comic book or a novel to be able to visualize it and uh, make it relatable. Uh, you were talking about pitfalls before and people um, writing things that come out kind of contrived. Uh, you could have, uh, uh, yeah, there's a plethora of problems that can happen, but being focused and trying to make something that makes sense and then writing it and uh, is, is very important because that'll transfer through to the reader. But you were talking about the pacing in the story um, when I sent that stuff to you, I appreciate you taking that on. You didn't have to do that. I'm sure you're very busy, but it was a, it was an amazing honor. Thank I'm you. also, a, a gr I'm also a greedy reader. You know, it's great <laughs> when people send me stuff, um, because oh. it's, it's a new storyteller. It's a new voice. It's something else, um, to read and consume. And, and it's different because, because it's a new voice. It's different. It's something it, it's, it's broadening my horizons. It's sort of like saying, oh yeah. A buffet. It'll have potato salad, cold ham, a jar of pickles, and a different potato salad that's golden instead of white. How nice. And then somebody says, oh, there's another whole room. And you go in and there's all sorts of different stuff. Oh, good. Now I'm interested. You see, the same thing. Giving me something new is another dish on my buffet. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, so you were you were talking about what was your opinion overall about it? We were talking about the pacing and you said there was the problem that um, that people have is the pacing and trying to give people the information and the action that they want, but not making it feel like an info well, dump. The problem you have in that comic, hmm. uh, the particularly the 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 super group with a lot of characters yep. is you have to 
bring on and introduce all these characters Mm -hmm. and bring on the world and the stakes. And it's almost easier to look over the shoulder of one or two characters. Um, Years and years ago, Roy Thomas scripted an Avengers issue and it was the woman's lib issue. It had the, the wasp flying through the keyhole at the beginning. And she flies to the keyhole and says, what is going on here? And it's the Scarlet Witch and so on, all meeting around a table. And then we cut to a parade in a small town. And everybody's dressing up as superheroes and villains. And well, some guy's sitting on a sofa dressed as the Red Skull and, some, and sipping a drink through a straw. And somebody else is dressed as Dr. Doom. And and the doorbell rings. And somebody says, get the door, will you? And he says, get the door yourself. Victor Von Doom is no man's lackey. You know, that sort of thing. Right. And when they, when they answer the door, it's Roy and Jeannie Thomas as themselves coming into the party. But because you were concentrating on one or two people close up doing everyday things, it works because you're being drawn into the story with just a few characters. You're looking over their shoulders and they're doing mundane things. So even though by the end of that party scene, you have somebody dressed as Nighthawk up on a car, which is a float in the middle of the parade, and the real villains, Claw and so on, show up. And they and he says, I suppose I could... Uh, get off <laughs> meaning <laughs> flee the hell off the car so you guys because you're you're for real by that time you've had something like 20 characters introduced to you but it doesn't feel like you're overwhelmed because yeah. you've had one or two at a time and that's the trick how do you get people into the story without overwhelming the reader or giving the reader a jumping off point which is the danger that happens if you're ever telling an origin story or retelling an origin story for a comic book character. You say, oh, this will be a great jumping on point for new readers. Yeah, it'll also be a great jumping off point for the people who've been collecting the book and now, now you're retelling, retelling the, origin the origin of the, origin of the, the, the story. story. Don't, don't do, do it. it. You know. You know. So, so you, you want to make sure, sure that your, your reader, reader is hooked, hooked into in the story. story. You want to figure, figure out how to, how to do, do that. that. And this is how we did it right here. This was the story you were talking about. The other stories are single heroes, but um, yeah, with yeah. this here with a group of eight, and I've been told also many times that group titles are challenging. And this is what you mean by looking over the shoulder and taking a few at a time and getting into the story. Ultimately, this is just the origin of how Ultra Ghost gets his powers. Um, mm-hmm. His nemesis attacks him. Um, with this, we only had five pages uh, for the preview because ultimately it costs money for pages. So we were able to do like a preview for it. So I had to make a decision on what I could show to accurately uh, give people the most to look at. So we did pages one through three. So here's yeah. page one. We did page two. And then we did page three here where the Federal Offensive Responders Unit is picking them up. They found an anomaly. Uh, and then this is seven and eight. Yeah. So the seven and eight is essentially like the dump that you were talking about where uh, where I wanted to make sure everybody knew what each character was. And it was just told from the point of view of um, of the narrator talking about them being tested for deployment. And I had to do that because the next two pages, four and five, is like back at federal offensive responders. And I didn't want to end on the page five because it wasn't a it wasn't an exciting page. So I thought a better way to end it with something exciting was action from all eight of them being tested instead for four or five. So that, that was more or less just, um, just a, uh, a preview decision. Cause yeah, this yeah. is our pitch book. This goes into our uh, showcase book. So that's why that ended up happening. But there was actually between page three and page four of this, there that's seven. There was actually four pages in between their story that led up to them being tested. So mm-hmm. Test their abilities being tested, but with only a five page limit, it was, yep, yep. you know, it was one I, of the I, other. I, I see the, the box, box you're in. in. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely a uh, constraint. It was a hard decision to make, but uh, ultimately that's what we did until we can get some more money to do some more work. Uh, 
you know, it's a character driven story too. Sure. It'll sure. be a lot of fun. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun, but I really appreciate you reading it and no your problem. advice too. That was very cool. But, but, but if, but I, if I, I express, express this, this in um, terms of movies that have just been released or recently released, Knives Out is a movie that's just been out. And it's it's basically Clue in a in an old mansion, you know, with a huge family, a huge cast. But one of the things they do in Knives Out is they have real close ups, which we haven't seen in movies for a long time. We are actually almost in the face of one character. And it's so refreshing because it forces us to pay attention to that character. And sometimes that character is slightly out of focus and we're actually looking past them at something else. But it still works because it simplifies your field even though you got a huge cast of characters. And another example of that same simple storytelling, at the end of um, the Ant-Man movie, where he's, Louis is telling him that the Falcon has been asking about him, you know, about the Avengers. You know, there, there's a huge bunch of jump cuts there. There's this real fine chick. And then there's Stanley as the bartender. And then there's Louis, Louis with his, with his brother. And, and he's at the, at the art gallery and he's jump, 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 jump. But because it's a few characters, it works. And it leads you right back to, yeah, yeah, yeah. what do he say? He say yes, you know, <laughs> but you're, it, it, it's a beautiful, you see, that's what you need to do. You need to engage the reader, pull them in close so they don't feel overwhelmed by all the stuff that's going on. Now, I, I realize what you're doing in that teaser, you are forced to do what you did because you have to right. tell the, the, you have to, you have to show the reader the stakes. You have to identify whatever, but you have to tell them the setting. In five pages, definitely yeah. a challenge. Just because that's all I had money for. I couldn't afford yeah. more artwork, so that's yeah. what I had. But, but if those of you who are out here who are telling novels, beginning novels, start simple. Um, there's a Colin Forbes, Heights of Zervos um, war thingy very, from years and years ago where they start in a snowy railway yard. And the hero is getting stalked by an ab man with a gun who's there to kill him. And he's, he's hiding amongst the railway cars in the snow, meaning people will be able to find his tracks. And the Abwehr guy is stalking him. And the snow's falling gently, and it's quiet, and it's nighttime. And he knows he's going to die. And that's the beginning of the thing. And through all that whole beginning scene, you are slowly getting fed the why he's here, what hangs in the balance. But it's brought down to that simple duel of wits in the softly falling snow at night in the railway yard. And that's how you get pulled into the book. And it's, it's, you, you, you keep it simple. You know, the old thing the teacher used to say, keep it simple, stupid kiss, you know, keep it simple, <laughs> stupid. So you keep it simple. You keep the reader engaged on something that really matters. And and I'll, I'll I'll tell you another one from a feature story years ago. There's a racing car driver up in Canada called Gilles Villeneuve. He was killed years and years ago in a in a car crash. But at the beginning, as a kid growing up in Quebec, he's racing way above the speed limit on rural roads that have all these uphill and down dale, so you can go over a blind hill, you know, that's too steep. And you and he comes over the blind hill, and there's a cow in the middle of the road. And the feature writer who's telling this feature then cuts away from that cliffhanger and tells you the whole story of Gilles Villeneuve and how she thinks he's going to win the world championship, which he did. And at the very end of the four pages later in the magazine article, she says, and why do I believe this? Because the cow you see, it was not touched. And then the article ends. You know, she's brought you back to the cow. It's like, Rrr! and I'll tell you this other thing. Oh yeah, the cow. It was not touched. <laughs> <laughs> For me, um, when I started early, I was uh, big into horror, and that uh, that inspired me. But aside from like be living in Maine um, and Stephen King novels too, as well, I grew up on. Uh, I read a lot of books growing up. I love novels. Uh, but one thing he did the Creep Show uh, graphic novels. 
with Bernie Whiteson as the artist. Yep. And that was in our school library. I don't know if they would ever let that go to school library today, but then it was there <laughs> all the time. You know what I mean? And, uh, oh, man, I loved reading that. I read it multiple times over. I loved the artwork and those short little bursts of story where there was just a horrific twist at the end and irony and all of those things were just so enjoyable for me i mean there's nothing like seeing the end of a story where the ironic twist is uh the guy that sh sh the wife put in the grave comes back as a zombie and he's there and he's got her head on a plate and it's frosted with candles and uh just some of those artwork some of those scenes were just uh yeah, it was fantastic. So I've always been a big fan of horror. Another one too is that recently I read George R. R. Martin's series Game of Thrones. I've never seen an episode of it, but I read the entire novel series. Um, so I'm an avid reader. I love comics and novel reading as well. It's not just one. Um, and so, and then all the source books as well. So many source books. We've got a monster library uh, uh, of books from first, second, and third edition. So I went back and got. I was a second edition guy as a kid because that was more what was out when I was that age, uh, but I got the other books too, the first edition books. And I like third edition too. I, I like third edition. I played it. Do you, um, do you have any, uh, have you been working any at all in fifth edition, the new edition that came out? Yep. You have so uh, you have source material. Oh, yeah. Out? Um, yeah. A border kingdoms came out a few days ago and that's an, an official release. Okay. Alex camera, camera and I did a, a border kingdoms. It's out at the D dungeon masters guild. But you can buy it as a hardcover or paperback, and it is Adventures League legal, and it is a, an official canon um, Forgotten Realms release. Um, yeah, I worked on Volo's Guide to Monsters. I wrote the Volo and Elminster back and forth. I actually wrote about twice as much as you see, because I wrote two or three things from each of them for each, uh, for each uh, section. And then they just used what they, they liked and what fit the layout. Um, and then I, I worked before that on Dungeonology, which uh, Matt Forbeck did, and I wrote the Elminster Forward. And yeah, I've, I've done some fifth edition stuff. I've designed in um, all of the editions of D&D, &D, except basic original, because I wasn't even a freelancer then. And fifth edition, I haven't done hard rules. That's the first one where the, the rules people were all in-house. But I've worked on... on release books and i've worked on water deep dragon heist and and um um i contributed unofficially to the sword coast adventures guide doing the the coinage and so on um oh, awesome. because of, because uh people at, at wizards would email me and i'd say and say have you got anything on this which was just the same thing as the realms were at the beginning when jeff grubb would pick up the phone and call me at the public library and, and say hey ed what do you have on the dungeon in this area? Oh, I'll just type it up and send it. Oh, what have you got on this? You know, what do they wear in Calumchen? Ah, no problem. Da, da, da. Type them up something and send it. And I wasn't being rude when I was typing. Actually, I went and searched, and it came up really easy. The Border Kingdoms uh, for uh, Dungeon Masters Guild, just like you said. People can buy the mm -hmm. PDF for the soft cover. They got a hard cover. So they got multiple editions there by Ed Greenwood. Uh, so I left the link in the chat for you guys, too, so that... If you guys are interested in picking up a copy, uh, you can go and buy the online stores right at that link. Like you can pick it right up. Mm -hmm. So that's fantastic. And, and so, by the end of April, there should also be a an anthology that a lot of us have worked on, uh, Elminster's Candlekeep Compendium. Oh, and I gotta and that. that isn't out yet, and it has an absolutely gorgeous map that I got to see for the first time about half an hour before we went on air. Um, if you like gorgeous maps, this product is worth buying just for the map. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Yeah, I love good cartography. It makes it so much better Like uh, when you're running the game to, uh, to have those maps. I could just look mm -hmm. at those even if I'm not running a game. They're just very interesting to me. Um, and, and, and if you're writing, if you're doing a campaign set in the realms, I have been working with Vorpal Dice um, Press um steve fiedler um on the amaroon's almanac series and they do different biomes in the realms like grasslands arctic desert so if you're out in the wilderness of the forgotten realms outside a city and you need okay what are the monsters what are the plants i can eat what are the plants i can use as medicines what's the weather going to look like 
they they are little DM Guild releases um, that you could just pick up and say, okay, so we're in the middle of the forest, and what do we got around us? Or we're in the, we're we're into a swamp now. What have we got around us? <laughs> Oh, that no, all those little details are what make the game. And I think that reading those books, like I said, growing up, those little details that you enjoy are the little details that as a writer, you put those in there because those are things that you enjoyed um, experiencing. And so that was a key part to uh, just my early beginnings of under just comprehending a story. And then eventually over years of experiencing it, uh, reading it, then you're able to write it in your own with your own imagination. So really like your pioneer work was something that was handed down to me in an, in an indirect, inadvertent way uh, and led to me being able to take all these fantastical, crazy things that go on in my head and translate them into books. So uh, and want to <laughs> translate them into comics, you know, it's a beautiful thing. Um, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't find the uh, the link for the uh, Elminster Candlekeep. Is there a link for it like to show the upcoming release or- I don't do think it's up yet. I don't okay. think it's up yet. There was a tweet from Justice Armand that showed the cover. And I think uh, MT Black, um, I think, retweeted that on Twitter. Um, but I don't think there's an entry at DM's Guild yet, because I don't think it's going to be up until the end of April um, for sale. But, yeah, if um, the, the cover was shown at Twitter, and that one has like tons of people writing it hmm. i was just on it as a consultant but i'm i'm really pleased with what they've done and, um yeah i i as you can see i'm keeping busy in the realms yeah i see that i mean that's uh, that's fantastic they're going to be able to get more world building from you um when i spoke with you on twitter when i approached you i remember you were saying that you do still uh write adventures for fans there's for are there forums that you're participating in as well mm-hmm yeah, I'm. I, I uh, Jeff Thetford, who's a fan of the realms, uh, he and Curry Russell put together the Mages and Sages podcast, and I do that every so often. And George Crashos and Eric Boyd, who are secret lore lords of the realms, and have spent their lives explaining away inconsistencies. And they both worked on the grand history of the realms and um, the Lost Empires of Faroon, and and uh, Eric did. Uh, the third edition um, Waterdeep City of Splendors book and collaborated with me on Serpent Kingdoms and so on. Um, we get together and talk realms. And I found it. Which one of these is the uh, is the one? And there's one on Reddit. There's the forums, and then there's uh, Mages and Sages at uh, forum.candlekeep.com, Candlekeep forum, and then there's very soon SageAdvice.eu. Oh, no, that's different. Sage Advice collects all of our Twitter responses for everybody. Oh, um, this one should probably say major. Yeah, it's probably the Reddit one. Well, wait a minute. Um, yeah, it, Mages and Sages is on YouTube, but there is a Reddit group that discusses it. Yeah. Oh, there's okay. Mages and Sages podcast. And I'll just look it up on YouTube and see if uh, Yeah. See if that uh, that gets me closer. Let's see. Yeah, so that people can subscribe. Absolutely, people are going to want to go see videos, interview with Old Mage on YouTube. The preview. Yeah, Mages and Sages, fans of Ed Greenwood, um, YouTube channel. I see it here. Oh, I see and, it right there. Yeah, there we are. I'm going to put that. And, and if those, those of you who want to hear my phone sex voice, there's a little <laughs> thing there that says Mages and Sages Fireside Promo. I didn't write the script for that. Curry did, but it it is a, um, a Barry White lives. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you guys wanted some voiceover work, so there you go. <laughs> you guys asked for it, and you got it, and then some. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ed, cut out. Oh, oh, it doesn't say the podcast. Uh, he'll be back. He's got the link if he needs me to send you a little bit. I think he. Uh, might have had a bad connection cut out. But what I'm going to do is uh, give you guys the link uh, for that podcast. You guys may have searched and already found it, but I just want to put the link up so that people can. And I'll check with him in a second. He's got the link, so if he wants to come back in, he can. 
Um, but Ed's been great. Uh, this has been fantastic. And to meet one of my childhood heroes, like it's amazing. And uh, somebody who inspired me to, uh, to write, he's back. There we go. Hey, Ed. Go ahead and say, are you muted? Yeah, it looks like. There we oh, go. Oh, you're good. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah, well, I told... Power cut. <laughs> I told them all that you cast a teleportation spell. Uh, <laughs> and you always do that at the end of your podcast. And it went terribly wrong. So I've got the, the entire audience looking in their closet for you right now and uh, hoping that you turn up. But, but you turned up here, so... I, I don't look good <laughs> in fishnets anymore. Even if you take the fish out of them, I just don't look good anymore. So I'm not probably not in your closet. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about that. If it if it comes that I'm not desperate for subs just yet, but for the next time when you come on, just keep the fishnet handy. If okay, you, if you could please. <laughs> <laughs> if we have to go that right, you know, get towards the end of the series, and you're worried about getting canceled. Sometimes you just gotta throw caution to the wind, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't hey, think so. right. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was fantastic. No, that, that was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm great. not wearing any tassels. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> don't worry, we don't have a budget for that. I'll but oh, I'll let okay. you know if I'll let you know if we're able to uh, upscale and, and make some stuff happen. <laughs> cool. Yes, yes. I live out in rural areas. If people want to wear fascinators, they have to shoot a bird. And it falls down, and they stick it on their dead bird on their head, and they have a fascinator. <laughs> that That's the sort of budget we do around here. <laughs> I think we're remote, too. We're kind of like, uh, it sounds like we're at rural. Like you said, well, honestly, like I'm out in the sticks. I mean, my town is, uh, like the, the the town I live in is named after the woods. So, <laughs> so that's the, town. the sticks, you know. You live in a town. Yes. Wow. I live in a village. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I would like to call it a village. I think they call it a town. I want to say they call it, uh, I don't, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we're, uh, it's, let's call it woodland. So if you want to know what the sticks are like, then, <laughs> you know, you, how, how do you feel about the city compared to living in the rural area? Well, I grew up in a, in Canada's largest city, Toronto. And um, it, for those of you who are keeping score, Toronto is a little larger than Chicago and smaller than LA. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it feels like Chicago because it's on a, on a lakefront. And, mm -hmm. and I grew up in, in a large city and the house I grew up in, which was a modest corner house in suburbia, um, the, the, which my parents bought when it was brand new, I would probably have to have around nine or $10 million to buy it at current mm. market prices. And because I work in libraries and I write books, I will never have nine or $10 million together in one place. <laughs> so I now live in the country um, where I can have four and a half acres with a woodlot for, yeah. you know, yeah. You That's know. right. I have my own barn and I have enough yard that I can put shipping containers full of books in it, whatever I want to. I just say, yeah, we'll, we'll cover that bit of yard. Oh, that's fantastic. I can't imagine. You said a wood lot too. I can't imagine you outside uh, split wood, but now that you say, you know, at first, but now that you say it, like, oh yeah, I could see you out there with the split and mall getting it done. Absolutely. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not allowed it. to fire up the wood stove or it, it cancels the insurance for my house, but yeah, we used to regularly, uh, uh, heat with wood here when I first moved out here 30 years ago. And <laughs> it's nice, and yes, heat, I, isn't it? Yeah. And I used I to cut all my own trees and carry them through the woods. I mm. always used just a, um, a sweet saw, um, bow mm. saw and, and an ax because they're all little kids, not mine playing in the woods. Yeah. And if you used a chainsaw, you couldn't hear if a little kid was coming up behind you. And then you, if you felled the tree on top of them, it would be just too bad. But yeah. if you're if you're doing it by hand, you can always hear when people are moving through the woods. I mean, it would be they tragic, don't... but it would make a great story. You know, <laughs> splat. You know. Uh, uh, <laughs> excuse me, I squished your kid. Be like George of the Jungle, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I I suppose I could I could pop the kid into an Irish stew and just never tell anyone. <laughs> yeah, uh, wait, you gotta watch it. <laughs> you gotta watch it when you go to Old Man Greenwood's property. They never return. <laughs> <You know? laughs> mm, yes well mm. that might be the start of your next great big novel i might yes. have just given it to you you i'll take a few i'll take royalties something reasonable just 
<laughs> yeah, well, it depends. You know, joke. if if I dig up the wood lot and start finding bodies, well, then none of us gets royalties because it's been done already. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. We could call it the reboot. The reboot. It, it yeah. seems to be pretty popular nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> Just write another story, you guys. <laughs> you know. Now, how did we get here exactly? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we were talking about the wood. Yeah, no, wood heat's great, though, isn't it? I'm sure you miss yeah. it because I grew up on wood heat, and this is we're in a cold area. You lived in Toronto, so you know uh, close by that. So, um, yeah, we always cut wood with loggers. I was 12 years old when I drew, drove my first skitter. My father's a, a logger. He had a three skitter outfit and stuff. So we always, but he would never buy wood. Never buy mm -hmm. wood. We always went and cut it ourselves. What mm -hmm. kind of logger would I be if I paid for wood? And so, and then we'd be like, Dad, come on, can you get a wood splitter? When they came out with them, can you get a snowblower, Dad, or a plow? Can you? He's like, I don't have to get those things. I had two boys. You know, <laughs> they'd give us a shovel, give us yeah. a split and maul. You know what I mean? <laughs> so we did everything by hand and then uh but but that wood heat's great i miss it we've got a pellet mm -hmm. stove here but the uh, augers went bad on it so we just have furnace but that heat you can't beat it nice and dry mm -hmm. and toasty yep. yeah yeah i couldn't stuff. believe it when i looked at my first pellet stove there and it says oh but you if there's a power failure it stops working and i said what yeah it needs power to feed the pellets yes what good is it then <laughs> I know that's, and we have some, we get our power from another town. And so we had issues with that where every time the power goes out, it happened at the beginning of the winter and we were, you know, I've got three kids. We just had a newborn in October. I'm 38 by the way. So my kids are 16, 11 and a newborn. Okay. So we, uh, when the power went out and we had no heat, I mean, there was no real snow on the ground, but it was chilly. We had to go, went to town. We were going to go and get a hotel room. It was super expensive. They knew they had us under the heel last minute and we were just like well maybe they'll get the power back on it's been 12 hours we said we'd drive home and see if the lights came back on and we slept in the car and handled the baby wait until and then the next morning it finally the power came back on we all got through it but yeah the power goes out the furnace is done all that stuff's mm -hmm. done you know mm -hmm. so it leaves you in a spot that's when you take the kids on a tour Let's go to the next McDonald's. Yeah. I think there's a McDonald's in the next town. Let's go there and we'll all have a junior chicken. Okay, yeah. now let's go to the next McDonald's. Absolutely. And you drive. <laughs> let's take the scenic route, honey. Yeah. <laughs> let's just make a time of it. You know, a bunch of screaming kids in the car. Wah! Kids. <laughs> it's just well, no, chaos. No, no. If you overfeed young kids, but not oh. with lots of sugar. They fall asleep. Oh, that's not a bad idea. So I'll after, just stuff them silly. And... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> after six burgers. <laughs> <laughs> and their like farts me. will warm the car. No. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Don't waste any of that heat. Yeah. Especially at that point. Yeah, I'm getting up there too. I mean, I eat a big dinner. I got to watch it. And I, I eat too much or I go out like a light. Got to take an old man nap. I know about old man naps. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm not, I mean, I'm not super old 38, but if I overeat now, it's different. It's not like overeating when you're 22, you know, that mm -hmm. stuff doesn't quite met metabolize. So you can feel a little bit of a difference. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. When you get if, old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so you're, you're staying near, uh, are you staying over across? You said you're in uh, Toronto still on the suburb. No. No, no, that, that's where I grew up. I'm, I'm now, um, I'm halfway between Toronto and Kingston on the north shore of Lake Ontario, um, a little east of Rochester. So if you went to Rochester, New York, and then you went east of Rochester about five miles, and then you went straight north across Lake Ontario, you'd hit the quarry that sits between me and Lake Ontario. Nobody in in my little village gets lake access because there's this giant gravel quarry in the way because you know concrete needs gr gravel so they have this giant quarry and every afternoon at around 1 30 they blast and all of our houses very briefly go <laughs> <laughs> nice 
<laughs> That's great. It's like when you see one of those sitcoms and uh, you go in to buy the apartment. You're like, hey, why is this apartment so cheap? And the plane flies over. You mean, yeah, is it really that heavy or what? Uh, no, it's a deep rolling boom. But um, oh. now there are houses in this village right next to the railway tracks hmm. that you do not want to use the plate rails because you put all your plates on the railing and a train goes past and all your China plates jump off the railing and hit you in the head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that close to it. They're still using trains. Yeah. I noticed oh, yeah. Got, we have some around here. They use them for hauling logs or like fuel or yeah, they still use them. There's quite a few mills around here that use them still. I was surprised that they still do it that way, but they got a great big long train. I sat at, I was doing plowing, commercial plowing and I was sitting at a, at a cross and, uh, I mean, I was there for like 10 minutes. I mean, this yep. train was ridiculous yep. how long 10 it was. minutes, yep. I, I yep. couldn't believe it. That, trail, that train was a mile long. I was like, jeez. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, now that we all have long-haul trucks, the railways that used to carry everything, they carry bulk goods. So the, you, you harness together as many cars as your locomotive will pull. And mm -hmm. 10 minutes later... The train is finished passing. <laughs> yeah, I was stuck there. I couldn't believe it. And we were on a time crunch trying to get through our plow in there a couple towns over. And I'm sitting there at the stop, so, uh, the stop there for the cross. I'm like, man, well, this will be over quick. That's all right. I'll, it'll be, it'll be good. And uh, like a mile later, like just mm -hmm. fuel tankers and logs and fuel. And that's when and you stuff. carry one of those little tape recorders. Well, nowadays people have cell phones, but I'm old school. So yeah. my phone, my cell phone is a phone. <laughs> That's it. No text, nothing. But I mean, nowadays you'd use your smartphone. But in the old days, you'd have one of those little executive uh, tape recorders. And you'd click it on and you, you write a story while the train's going past. And you tell yourself all the cool scenes. You could do an entire issue of a comic book before the train is rolled past yeah yeah absolutely i see that in the movies now i know where that comes from yeah they keep a little tape recorder to i'd have a little pad have one of those little pads in your pocket flip it open like a detective right yes down some exactly clues, well right that, down some clues in there. that's where arnold schwarzenegger is saying oh they had to catch a train <laughs> <laughs> you have to catch a train back to the yeah. chopper yeah. you like that yeah. I was big into those 80 act. What's your fa favorite 80s action movie? Mm, that's a toughie. Yeah. True Lies, I think. Oh, I remember. Yeah, Arnold Schwarzenegger was really yeah, good. Yeah, because it's a hoot. It's got so much fun stuff in it. And it had Jamie um, Lee Curtis in it. Yeah. And and if we go back further than that, my favorite ones would be uh, Kiss the Girls and Make Them Die. That's probably before my time, you mean? I was born in 81, so. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and there used to be this great TV series with George Pirate on it called Banachek. Hmm. And Banachek was all um, locked room mysteries or mysterious disappearances, like hmm. an airplane disappears from an airfield or um, all these really expensive sculptures vanish from a sealed art gallery. And the solution always had a reenactment as he told everybody how it had happened and they do flashbacks. So you'd actually see the crime being committed. It was really cool. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. I've always liked mystery. My wife and I also watch a lot of those unsolved. She watches a lot of unsolved mystery mm -hmm. documentaries or those kind of things. Uh, and so, uh, so they're very cool. My, I have to say my favorite action, but obviously we're talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger was very good. And I liked that. Uh, I don't know if it's considered more of a, a a horror than an actual. I was like Predator was a classic, the original with Schwarzenegger, and I think that goes back to me talking about things being dark and having a scary type of villain or opposition. Um, but another one, geez, oh, there's so many good ones. He the man who would be king. If if you yeah. want to go away from modern times, the man who would be king was Sean Connery and Michael Caine, and Christopher Plummer playing Rudyard Kipling. Oh yeah, that's a, those are great actors. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. There are there are lots of there are lots of great movies out there, but hey, we have to write great stories so that people will forget those movies and pay attention to our stories. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. The train keeps on rolling, right? And yeah, absolutely. We do need new ideas. I mean, those things are what you know. It's not a those things inspire us, and that's got to be passed on to the next generation. So, you know, mm -hmm. it could be you. It could be anybody who comes yeah. up with that next great story and. And I uh, would even say if, if we if we want to uh, 
if we want to count it as an adventure movie, The Princess Bride. There's an adventure movie for you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. Uh, I don't know if that's my cup of tea, but, but you never know. How much money is in writing stuff like that? That might change my writing. Life. Writing the scripts, eighty grand. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. a Hollywood script is eighty grand. Ooh, that's I could do a lot with eighty grand. Mm -hmm. mm. There you go. Now, yeah. if you can write, if you can write ten of them in a row, eight hundred thousand dollars. Man, that's you'll be fantastic. rich beyond the green of average. You'll be able to uh, afford new underwear. Yeah. You know? <laughs> 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 well yeah you know you're gonna have to buy some new underwear if that first film crit there you go gets that in you you're trying to scramble to get the next one yeah the first one's gonna well, be a success <laughs> as stan lee once said to me oh hey you're writing for us you can now afford wheels for that car <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good <laughs> and i said Stan, can I afford four of them? He says, you need five, kid. The steering wheel is the fifth one. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's great. He says, he says, you young whippersnappers, you know, you always forget the steering wheel. <laughs> five. <Yeah. laughs> well, wouldn't that be oh, terrible? That sounds like something I'd do is I'd be like, oh, I got four wheels. I'm ready to go. Jump in. Start it up. <laughs> Not be able to steer. Oops. Oops. Yeah, absolutely no way to steer. Just punch it right to the floor. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. say, here i come yep but that's great hey i appreciate it and uh it's getting uh we're just about at midnight i really appreciate your time uh thank you so much uh, we have recurring guests and um hopefully uh if my charm spell works next time we'll have to uh go ahead and cast that and get you over here again <laughs> sure yeah uh, and i'm happy to talk about anything we can talk about writing we could talk about comics we could talk about anything you want to talk about Oh, I'm, I'm sitting great. down. It's great. <laughs> that sounds awesome. And you, you're so encouraging. You're an inspiration, Ed. And uh, thanks for reading my work. When we get those finished, when I finally figure out a way to get all the art's pretty expensive, but when I find a way to get all this stuff fu funded, I'll, uh, I'll find a way to get you some of it. So that way, cool. I, I appreciate that was inspiring for you to listen to, uh, you know, hear me out and read my work. Thank you so much. And we'll get something over your way. And then if mm -hmm. we make some magic happen, I won't forget that Ed Greenwood may be one of the greatest writers, fantasy writers of the 20th century, but he may just be one of the greatest voice actors of the 21st. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been listening to the inexorable word nerd. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> you know what that is? That I don't know why that puts people off so bad when they read it. Uh, some people laugh straight up and then some people choke on it. It's like they always took the inex <clears throat> inexorable word nerd they choke midway through as they realize what they're saying. And oh, and <laughs> okay. Here's what you got to do. You you've got to pose like Thanos, Absolutely. as if you're going to snap your fingers, blood. and then say, "I'm inexorable." <laughs> <laughs> I do. I need a catchphrase, like an evil catchphrase <laughs> of some kind. Like, listen to me now. I am inexorable. And then snap my fingers. There you go. Yeah. And destroy it. Destroy everybody. Yeah. No. Uh. That, they get put taken back for it, but ult, like by it. But ultimately, the word nerd part is uh, being an aficionado for words. Um. I've always loved them, and when I it was a great moment when I realized that the written and read word is what I wanted to do. I wanted that that type of uh, expression, and the inexorable part is really just trying to punch through and get that start. You have to be inexorable. You have to not quit. You have to have thick skin. You have to be willing to take criticism. You have to be willing to give and take and uh, take chances. And there's just so much that comes along with it. And inexorable is my favorite word, I have to say. Probably out of every – yeah, it's my favorite word. I mm -hmm. love that. There's so, it entails so many things that are that are that uh, that you need. So, yeah, you need that push. And Look for me at sunrise on the third day. <laughs> That's so good. Yeah, we're definitely have to get you in on that, man. You are you're good. Yeah. <laughs> You are good. We're going to do it. We'll find a good role for you if we get to that point, okay? Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, thank you, everyone, for showing up. And uh, thank you, Ed Greenwood, for coming. Uh, we'll have to, I'll let you know. I'll get in touch with you. Maybe when you have another release or something, we'll come back and let everybody know what it is. And then we'll uh, we'll shoot the proverbial breeze. Sounds good. Thanks, Ed. I'm That's always awesome. up for that. Thank you. 
Oh, that sounds great. Thank you. Okay, you have a good night. Yeah, you too. Thanks, man. All right, good okay. night, everybody.